Welcome to the 41st annual Walk for Justice. Today we commemorate the death of Jesus on the cross. We recognize that his crucifixion is more than an event from over 2,000 years ago. We believe on Jesus' word that his passion and death continue today in his people. He has told us that whenever we participate in another's suffering, either by omission or commission, we do it to him. So today, we make a traditional and contemporary Good Friday prayer and devotion, the way of the cross. We make our prayer as the church, the body of Christ. We pray in a spirit of penance and of hope. Penance for our part in Good Friday's continuing crucifixion and hope in the Easter resurrection of eternal life. And we pray that we may be the hope of the resurrection for those whose hope has been given over to despair. We trust that God is at work in us and will help us remain faithful and steadfast on the journey. Let us go forth now in reverence to walk the way of the cross. Oh, I thought you were not in the first station, Jesus is brought before Pilate to be judged. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Betrayed by his, by his friend, condemned by the high priest for blasphemy, Jesus was led away to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, for judgment. It was the hope of the religious leaders that he be condemned to death and thus rid them of the problems he was causing. Pilate looked scornfully at the priest who had accompanied Jesus. Is this your dangerous aspirant to kingship? He asked, tattered, barefoot, emaciated. He turned and spoke to Jesus. The chief priests of your temple accuse you of leading the people astray. Jesus remained silent, of telling them not to pay tribute to the emperor, continued Pilate. Jesus still gave no answer, of claiming to be king of the Jews. If my kingdom were of this world, my own would have fought to prevent me from surrendering to the Sanhedrin. But my kingdom is not of this kind. You are a king then, said Pilate. Yes, I am, said Jesus. It was for this that I was born. This is why I came into the world, to bear witness to the truth. And all who are on the side of truth listen to my voice. What is truth? asked Pilate. Who are you? Shortly thereafter, Pilate handed over Jesus to be crucified. In mid-January 2019, Santiago and Mercedes left their young son with Mercedes' brother, Fabio, to go buy groceries. They never came home. They were stopped and detained by ICE agents on their way to the grocery store. Fabio kept the children in his home with his sister, Magdalena, and her husband, Sergio, and their three children. They were caring for three boys under five, including an 18-month-old and two elementary school-aged girls. A week later, ICE officers went to the home and said that they were doing a welfare check on the children and, when allowed to enter their home, took Fabio into custody. Sergio, who remains in the home, is also undocumented and does day labor. They are Guatemalan and speak an indigenous language. This family of two adults and five children has a card table, a few folding chairs, and one bed. They will not open the door unless they have received a text in advance that someone will be leaving food on their porch. An Omaha group, which attempts to support and accompany undocumented immigrants, began assisting this family in late January. On their first visit to leave groceries, they saw cockroaches on the walls and mice on the floor. People had generously donated cans of food, but the family didn't have a can opener. They have no attorneys, 
Undocumented immigrants are not entitled to free legal assistance, as is typical in criminal cases in the U.S., and many immigration attorneys charge $200 per hour. People who can't afford a can opener are unlikely to be able to hire an attorney. This is happening in Omaha, Nebraska. Now the cross as Jesus bore it has become for us who share it the jeweled cross of victory. The second station, Jesus is condemned to death. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. At last, Jesus' Jesus's head went slack against the column, and the whipping was called to, to a halt. Enough, said the officer, put his clothes back on. But he said he was a king. The centurion protested, the king of the Jews. Surely we ought to attire him as befits his rank. He laughed and pulling a purple cloak from the nearest soldier draped it about Jesus. Another soldier catching the spirit of the game disappeared for a moment and returned carrying a branch studded with long piercing thorns. He deftly twisted the branch into the shape of a crown which he placed on Jesus' head and crushed down. Hail, King of the Jews, they mocked. Having grown tired of the game, the guards dragged Jesus back to Pilate. Jesus was scarcely able to stand. Pilate flinched slightly at Jesus' appearance. Blood had congealed on his forehead where the crown of thorns had pierced. The purple cloak did little to hide the terrible welts and wounds on his body. Pointing to him, Pilate turned to the crowd, which had gathered in the courtyard, and said, Behold the man! To his surprise, for he had expected them to feel sympathy for a fellow Jew held prisoner, the crowd yelled, Crucify him! Crucify him! Unable to resist them any longer, Pilate gave in to their demand and ordered him to be executed. I am sure that few people can be unaware of the tragedy that beheld Matthew Shepard, a 21-year-old student at the University of Wyoming in Laramie. Several years ago, in early October, this young man was lured by two men and their accomplices into the outskirts of that city. There he was beaten, robbed, tortured, and left to die in freezing weather, tied to a fence like a scarecrow. He succumbed to his injuries a few days later. This horrific crime was made even more heinous by a further chilling fact. Matthew was targeted for this brutality, in part because he was gay. We who have been given a special care for the spiritual, moral, and intellectual care of our young can only shudder at this horrible act. We condemn this crime and its motivation in no uncertain terms. From the richness of our Roman Catholic tradition, we offer our prayers for Matthew, his family, his loved ones. We can also for all to pray for the individuals who killed Matthew and forgive them, that they may be moved to compunction for their offense and seek reconciliation. We condemn any act of hatred against lesbian, gay, or transgendered people and insist on the intrinsic dignity and inviolability of all individuals. Motivated by the gospel, we will continue to seek justice for all those who are the object of hate and prejudice anyone who our society would marginalize and claim to be less than fully human and hence expendable. Weak and prodded, cursed and fallen, his whole body bruised and swollen, Jesus tripped and laid in pain. There was one more. The third station, Jesus falls the first time. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, 
because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Weakened by the loss of blood from torture, suffering from hunger and thirst, and bowed under the weight of the cross, Jesus tottered and fell heavy to the ground. How could the one who keeps the whole universe on its feet experience a fall? And yet, the eternal Son of God did make first-hand contact with the dust of the ground. Hunger, thirst, fatigue, hot and cold weather, an insecure life without a roof over his head, tears, fears, sadness, persecution, slander, death threats, strong temptations, panic and anxiety over death, imprisonment, torture, and crowning with thorns. All these things were experienced personally by the Son of Heaven when He walked among us. The underemployed fall through the cracks. Vivian strains under the weight of providing for her family. She works two part-time jobs earning minimum wage and neither employer will give her enough hours to qualify for benefits. Before and after work, Vivian drives 30 extra minutes to her cousin's house where she leaves her three-year-old because other daycare is too expensive. Vivian's husband works long hours for low pay. His income barely covers the cost of rent and health insurance. Vivian's husband is diabetic and must regularly visit a doctor. Even with insurance, the family struggles with the cost of his medications. When their car's transmission needed to be replaced, Vivian's husband paid the mechanic rather than filling his prescriptions. After weeks without medication, he collapsed and was rushed to the emergency room. With insulin and rest, he soon felt better, but the hospital bills forced Vivian and her husband to work extra shifts leaving their children at home on nights and weekends. During that time, the family relied on food that school sent home in the children's backpacks. Many families at school struggled to make ends meet, but some students teased Vivian's children for needing help. Vivian feels defeated. She is exhausted after stretching every dollar and saying no when the children ask for anything outside the family's budget. Vivian is tempted to turn away from Jesus but she does not. She remembers that Jesus became human. He understands the burdens of our lives. Vivian asks Jesus to hear and share her fears. As we reflect on Jesus falling the first time, may we pray for just and living wages for all who labor. The fourth station, Jesus meets his mother. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. We see Mary close to her son Jesus. She has nurtured him in the ways of faith. She has seen him at an early age claim to be about his father's business. She knows that he is special. She has shared his joys and now mourns his suffering. And the mother of Jesus follows the procession of his death. Still shaky from his fall, his face covered with sweat, spittle, sand, dirt, and blood. His eyes bulging, Jesus happens upon the figure of his loving mother in the midst of the noisy crowd. The words stick in their throats. They cannot even gesture to each other. Only their glances meet. Mary, silent and powerless to help, offers comfort and support with her presence and her tears. We meet Jesus' mother. Mary, the one blessed, was also familiar to ridicule and rejection. 
Today, Mary remains ever accessible to anyone who flees to her protection or implores her help. On this Good Friday at this fourth station, let us pause to meet this woman in a familiar form of prayer as we recite together this litany. Mary, you who were and are the mother of God, pray for us. Mary, you who were once the unwed mother, pray for us. Mary, you who risked all by choosing life for your baby, pray for us. Mary, you who were once the political refugee, pray for us. Mary, you who were once the homeless one, pray for us. Mary, you who were once the disciple and prophet, pray for us. Mary, you who were once a third woman, world woman, pray for us. Mary, you who were once the mother of a criminal, pray for us. Mary, you who buried your murdered son, pray for us. Mary, you sti who still are the one full of grace, pray for us. Simon, stop in hesitation, not foreseeing his proud station. Called to bear the cross of Christ. The fifth station. Simon helps Jesus carry the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Jesus, who had been awake all night, gone through an early morning trial and beating is growing weaker and weaker. We see him stumble under the weight of the cross. Simon of Serene is forced by the soldiers to take up the cross and carry it toward Golgotha. Tradition tells us that Simon was visiting Jerusalem from another city, and that he happened by chance to be on the road to Calvary as Jesus and the cross arrived. He was an innocent bystander who became very much involved, a strong individual who helped Jesus bear his cross. We help each other when we come together. We all have an earthly destiny to lift each other's crosses. That lifting contributes to the common good. Pope Francis has told us in Laudato Si, that the climate is a common good, belonging to all and meant for all. We are presently witnessing a disturbing warming of the climatic system, accompanied by a constant rise in ocean levels and extreme weather events. He reminds us that it is the poor who are now most affected by climate change, and he encourages policies that reduce our dependence on fossil fuels that, scientists tell us, are primarily responsible for climate change. We, who have thrived on a society and economy built on fossil fuels, must now lift the crosses of eroding coastlines, extreme droughts, and crop failures, heat waves, massive forest fires, and increasing hurricanes. In the second creation story in the book of Genesis, we are told that the Lord God then took the man and settled him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and care for it. In many ways, we have abused the garden, and now all of humanity struggles under the cross of climate change. Brave but trembling came the woman, none but she would flaunt the Roman. Moved by love beyond her fear. The sixth station, Veronica wipes the face of Jesus. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Those who loved Jesus stood among the crowds as he was brutally dragged forward along the street. Their hearts ached. A voice could be heard saying, he was despised and rejected by all, 
a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief and carried our sorrows. He was smitten by God and afflicted. For our transgressions, he was wounded. He was bruised by our sins. The price of our sins had laid upon him and by his wounds, we are healed. The guards, weary of the hostility of the crowd, began to urge Jesus forward to make him move faster. A woman emerged from the crowd and mercifully wiped the sweat and blood from his face. His sight cleared for a moment by her touch, allowed him to gaze at Veronica's face as if to memorize her features, even while his own was etched into her cloth. Then he moved on toward Calvary. The often forgotten, ignored plight of the Native American. The example of Veronica challenges us to go against the current, to reach out to those on the margins. Lord, help me to see your face in our Native American brothers and sisters and to respond to all in need. Many people who live in the city of Omaha are unaware that its name came from the people who lived here long before European settlers arrived. For centuries, the Omaha nation's traditional hunting grounds stretched from Bellevue to Homer, Nebraska, approximately 120 miles north and south, and 100 miles west of the Missouri River. After many broken treaties, their reservation now stretches approximately 15 miles north and south and 30 miles east and west. It is by far the closest thing to third world conditions in our state, with 70% unemployment. They are the face of Jesus in our midst today, battered, bloody, and spit upon. Who of us will follow the example of Veronica and reach out with mercy and love? Dust he crumbled, plugged in body he resembled. All our people poor and scourged. The seventh station, Jesus falls the second time. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The surreal procession passed through the streets of Jerusalem, and he was he was prodded as a lamb to the slaughter and uttered and offered no resistance. A loud mob crowded and bumping into him, faint from scourging, eyes burning, vision blurred by blood and sweat, exhausted by lack of sleep and stumbling barefoot on a rocky road, Jesus again falls with the heavy weight of the wood and of the world. A second time his body and face meet the ground, the stones, the dirt. He reopens old wounds and makes new ones. Jesus will continue collapsing as his strength flows from him. Our nation falls for modern slavery. Laura met a new guy who was a little mysterious, but nice and clean cut. They'd known each other for about a year when he told her he was driving to Chicago and offered a ride so she could hang out with friends. Everything was great until they reached the city. He asked to use her cell phone. Being naive and young, I just passed it to him. Followed him inside. As we were going downstairs, he punches me in the face and I feel blood running down. Don't do anything stupid. Do whatever I tell you to do. She was thrown in a dark room with red lights, concrete floor, and a bed built into the wall. The whole time was a blur, being drugged, beat, raped repeatedly. I didn't know if the next guy was going to beat me. He had my phone. My parents would contact me. He would text as if it was me. If they would call too much, he'd give me the phone. But, he, but would threaten me. Remember, I know where your family lives, and I will kill your nephew. 
Her traffickers came in one day and said, we're leaving. They drove to South Dakota to a house of drugs, gambling, and prostitution. And the cycle begins all over again. One John, after the next John, after the next John, after the next John. Then you have all the pimps and they take their turn at you. I was smart, never backtalked. They asked me to do something, I did it. I cooked, I cleaned, it was like slavery, like slave days, you were just modern day. You never would think, driving past this house, that there are girls in there that can't leave. Your sense of, of worth, you don't feel like a human being. And I think that's the biggest thing with a lot of trafficking victims that people don't understand. Traffickers told her they were moving again. If I didn't do something or if I didn't try to run, I could disappear and I knew what disappearing meant. Laura made up a story about needing to go to a nearby gas station. She jumped a fence, ran, got a phone, called the police, who said, we're more interested in the, a drug investigation. The police arrived. She waited for her parents to come and bring her back to Nebraska. The next day they took her to the hospital to begin treatment of a long list of injuries. May our sympathy for Jesus turn to those who now here need us. May we see Christ bruised in them. The eighth station, Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Many women are there, some watching from a distance, others close by. Indeed, included are those who have been with him all along and have looked for him. Jesus is being mourned by these women in the crowd. They have come to know him as a person aware of their identity as daughters of God. Jesus is mindful of their lot in life. They cannot help him now. They can only weep and show compassion. He hears their weeping and is conscious of their sorrow to see him abandoned in such misery. Jesus speaks to them, daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. Who consoles the women of today? Anne is a single, young mother of three severely disabled children. Every year she fights with Social Security income, the SSI, the bureaucracy, as every year they declare one or more of her children no longer eligible for the income. And every year they are later reinstated. In the meantime, Anne falls behind in the rent and utilities. She must pay fines for late payments to her landlord. She narrowly avoids homelessness. One of her children, Timmy, is 11 years old. He cannot walk on his own and has the emotional maturity of a toddler. Another must have medicine intravenously three to four times daily. Her mother occasionally helps with the kids, but friends have become a distant memory. Don't get me wrong, she says. I love my kids, but this is so hard. Anne comes to my office seeking help with rent or food, any way the church can help. I hate to ask my church, she says with eyes downcast, but I don't know where else to turn. Her son's incessant questions interrupt our conversation. She sighs, looks down with tender, tired eyes, holding back tears, and assures him that he will be soon home. Rage fills me. Anne's most important job is rearing her children. Children no one else can reach. Yet our culture does not acknowledge her mothering ministry. Instead, this mother feels she is worthless burden on, a, on the world. Jesus fell again in weakness stumbling as we do to lead us 
through our sorrow and our pain. The ninth station, Jesus falls the third time. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Again, the dirt, the pain, face, sweat and blood, arms weak and scraped, chest and legs pinned against the earth under the weight of the falling lumber. In and out of numbing consciousness, Jesus lies prostrate again. His energy exhausted, he can no longer stand, let alone walk. Another collapse. Along with his body, his spirit is also shattered. The dream is gone. The reign of God, that time and place when just of justice and peace, of reconciliation and right relationship, where love is the bottom line all vanished as his life pass, pressed against the earth, now drains into his death. Yet through the awful grace of God, he stands again. The nation falls for abortion. It is easy to dehumanize those we cannot see or hear. Those without an effective voice end up being stripped of their fundamental dignity and rights. With no one to speak for them, they are denied a place at the table of our society. The unborn child in the womb has no voice to defend her right to life. He is unheard and unseen and can be condemned to death in what the servant of God Dorothy Day called another form of genocide. We defend their lives because we believe the unborn are among the vulnerable for whom the church wishes to care with particular love. We ask today for a society that will legally protect all the unborn and will reach out to the parents who feel alone and without options. We pray for a love that will welcome all the marginalized. We pray for a defense of life in all its stages. by his own nation, Jesus stood in desolation, giving all he had to give. The tenth station, Jesus is stripped of his garments. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. God, the shamefulness and hardness of heart within your people seems like it has no limits. You are allowing nothing, you are allowing nothing in the end save your cross. You are stripped of your clothing, one final humiliation before your death among a jeering, mocking crowd. It is a moment of utter shame. You find yourself naked, vulnerable, and defenseless before the swelling, irreverent, and angry crowd. Jesus is stripped of his clothes. A man came into the St. Vincent de Paul thrift store asking for help to get a change of clothes. He explained that he needed the clothes for something important. It's for my mama's funeral. I haven't seen my family in such a long time, and I just don't have anything proper to wear. With some frustration, I spent the next 45 minutes finding sizes and matching ties to trousers and coats. A few days later, he returned to the store. He held out his hand to shake mine, and I struggled to say what he wanted to tell me. I've been on the streets for a long time, I just can't seem to quit drinking. It's tough and I get so messed up. When I showed up at my mama's funeral looking so fine, no one could believe it. My brothers and sisters hugged the stuffing out of me. 
and told me how glad they were to see me. I haven't had a drink since the funeral, and I'm thinking about getting some help. I've tried it before, but maybe this time I'm ready. I'm going to keep those clothes you gave me because they made me feel like I belonged. Who knows, maybe I'll need them for a job one of these days. Our faith calls us to recognize the dignity in each person, which can be difficult day after day when so many people with so many complicated problems find their way to our door. Jesus was stripped of his clothes in the ultimate act of humiliation. The man at the thrift store set aside his shame to ask for clothes he needed in order to fit in at his mother's funeral. It's a simple act, clothing the naked, a simple request from Jesus. Let us look past the outward signs of poverty to find the face of Jesus. Is the hands that blessed and cured us, is the feet that walk to free us, Walk the hill of Calvary. The eleven station, Jesus is nailed to the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The moment has come. Now it happens. They're really going to do it screamed Jesus silently in his weakened, exhausted, and terribly frightened state. The soldiers force him to the ground. The scourging wounds reopen on his back, and he is slammed against the earth. Strapping his limbs onto the cross, the metal spikes pierce the flesh on his wrists and feet. Unknown agony is made manifest. Blinding pain increases as the wood is hoisted to an upright position and jolted into its resting place. Punishing pain for an already bloodied and battered body. Jesus' mind wanders. His heart is crushed in, is crushed in defeat and shame. Abandoned by friends, he is finally abandoned by his God. A thirst consumes his being. He verbalizes words of thirst. Vinegar is forced onto his lips and into his mouth. Passerby, passers by jeer. Others call him names. Laughter is heard among the crowd. Just another criminal getting what he deserves, the death penalty. Who is this man whose voice yet whispers Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they are doing. Crucifixion Meditation The ugliness and sin of nailing you. The ugliness and sin of injustice in our world. I do not like to think about it. It hurts too much to really look at others in their suffering. At you in all that pain. You. You who are good. You you who love, you who say in the midst of your very ugly and very bloody murder, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Talk about a stumbling block. Yes, indeed, Christ crucified a stumbling block to many. Me too, Lord, I'm one of the many. I cannot, cannot stand to look at you or anyone persecuted or your blood, small rivulets streaming down wood and dirt or their blood covering the grass and mud walls of huts and churches. My fear of pain, my fear of death, keep me from you and keep me from them. My fear becomes sin. I keep my distance from you, from your pain and death and of the others who get nailed. And so, walking blindly and weakly, wanting to be one of your disciples, I come to Calvary. I come in public prayer. I come to the only Savior I know. I lift my head and look at you, but I cannot see you, only your pain and death. And I, too, mutter words too familiar to your ears on the original Good Friday. Fix it. Stop it. Dear God, please stop it. Get him off that cross. Stop the insanity. Why don't you stop it? 
Forgive me, God, in my own pain and fear, I forgot all about yours. Open my eyes that they may fix their gaze on you, even when you are suffering, dying, dying to show me and the many that you really do love us and that pain, suffering, and even death itself are not the end, are not the last word. Love is, your word is the last word. Life eternal, death defiant, Bowed his head, the world was silent. Through his death came life anew. Twelfth station, Jesus dies on the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. The nightmare of pain and suffering ends. After three hours on the cross, Jesus dies. Stunned the stricken Mary mother, in your arms was placed our brother, full of grace now filled with grief. The thirteenth station, Jesus is taken down from the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. It is finished. It is over. He is gone now. Yet his body hangs there lifeless on the wood. Numb, his family and friends gather to gently take him down, to get him away from the shame and from the laughing and mocking crowd. His mother waits with arms both open and flailing, ready to receive her son, her battered, broken, and dead son.
to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Were you Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when the sun refused to shine? The 14th station, Jesus is laid in the tomb. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. It was now evening, and since it was the vigil of the Sabbath, there came Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent member of the council, the Sanhedrin, who himself lived in the hope of seeing the reign of God. He boldly went to Pilate, and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate, astonished that he should have died so soon, summoned the centurion and inquired if, indeed, he was already dead. Having been assured of this by the centurion, he granted the corpse to Joseph. Joseph then brought a shroud, helped take Jesus down from the cross, wrapped him in the shroud, and laid him in the tomb which had been hewn out of rock. A stone was rolled against the entrance to the grave. Mary of Magdala and Mary, the mother of Joseph, were watching and took note of where he had been laid. We are buried in him. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Among our family members, circle of friends, co-workers and colleagues, who is willing to be there for others for the long haul, like Joseph of Arimathea and the group of women who accompanied Jesus to Calvary, who is sustained by faith and hope in spite of the cross that they bear, the spouse who is loving, losing the love of her life to Alzheimer's disease, willingly adapts to the daily responsibilities of caregiver, deeply misses the depth of relationship she and her spouse shared as a married couple. The grandparent who assumes guardianship of grandchildren, patiently provides consistency of routine, has energy to read one more story and offer one more I love you at the end of very long days. The teacher who sees a spark of potential in the student everyone has given up on, offers a listening ear to parents who are stressed with life, lends a smile, pat on the back, a word of encouragement to all. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God has ready for those who love. Spirit of love, come, give us the mind of Jesus, teach us the wisdom of God. gift accepted in three days you resurrected you did first what we shall do 
the 15th station, Jesus rises from the dead. We adore you, O Christ, and we praise you, because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. Jesus finally experienced death, as we all will. But death was not, and is not, the final word. The final word was and is love. Though he was brutally killed, died and was buried, he did not remain dead. He lives. He is alive. We are not talking about simply living in you and in me, although he does that also. But Jesus lives now. This one who would not stay dead continues to live and promises us that one day he will return and come for us. We are waiting for you, Jesus. He is alive. He lives. This we believe. Amen. We pray for peace. Let us go forth. Then let us go forth to offer everyone the life of Jesus Christ. Here I repeat for the entire church what I have often said to the priests and laity of Buenos Aires. I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. If something should rightly disturb us and trouble our consciences, it's the fact that so many of our brothers and sisters are living without strength, light and consolation, born of friendship with Jesus Christ, without a community of faith to support them, without a meaning and a goal in life. More than by fear of going astray, my hope is that we will be moved by the fear of remaining shut up within our structures, which give us a false sense of security, within rules which make us harsh judges, within habits which make us feel safe. While, our door, while at our door, people are starving, and Jesus does not tire of saying to us, give them something to eat. Thank you very much for participating in this 41st annual Walk for Justice Stations of the Cross. Especially this year, uh, we want to extend to you our, our desire that we all recognize hope. In the midst of this worldwide pandemic, let hope be our weapon that we use to beat away darkness and desolation. Jesus Christ is risen. That is what we believe. Let us continue to keep that alive in our hearts. God bless you all and have a, a blessed Good Friday.